Uh, so Michelle Byers uh, was born in August uh, of 1955. And uh, I went to college um, to about four different colleges till I finally was able to graduate. <laughs> I kind of bounced around quite a bit. Um, but I graduated from uh, Western State College out in Gunnison, Colorado um, with a degree in, in biology. Uh, and then I came back to uh, New Jersey where my parents lived looking for a job in, in the field of, of uh, biology and conservation. And, uh, you know, just sort of by serendipity, I got interviewed by um, the Conservation and Environmental Studies Center in the general store. And it was uh, Eugene Vivian and John Tiedemann were the two people who interviewed me. And they were, you know, super nice. And it just seemed like really like a fun thing. And so I got the job. And uh, <laughs> it was, it's like anything in the Pine Barrens, I guess, at that time, that was 1980. I started out living in the schoolhouse and um, which of course had no kitchen, just a little, it had a bathroom. That was pretty much it. And uh, a, a, another um, student from Stockton University, Betty Ann Kelly, she came to live in the schoolhouse with me. We worked for the Conservation Environmental Studies Center. Uh, Betty Ann worked, I think on natural resource inventories and I worked on a recycling curriculum for fifth and sixth graders. And, uh, you know, that was sort of the beginning of, um, you know, just getting to know White's Bog. I mean, it was pretty much uh, uh, abandoned, even though the Conservation Environmental Study Center had a lease on the village uh, and they sublet out to people to live there. Um, nobody was really watching anything and there was no renovation plan in place. And it, people were kind of um, doing whatever they wanted to the houses they lived in. Um, you know, cutting holes through the wall to make the room bigger or, you know, putting in whatever. And we were all paying $10 a month rent to live in the houses. Um, and, and that was to cover the water bill. When you moved to White Spog, were there any people that might have been from the Cranberry Company town? Yeah, um, right next to the schoolhouse. You know, remember, there's those two little one, one story houses. Uh, Jimmy lived in one of them with his wife and his grandson. And uh, Jimmy was from Puerto Rico and he was working for JJ White. So I got to be good friends with him and his little grandson, Jimmy. I think it was James, we called him James. Uh, and then across the way, uh, another woman who was a widow was living in the, the other house. She was African-American and she had been working for the JJ White company. So they were still there for, I would say a good year or so while I was living there. Um, and, um, you know, I don't really, remember what happened like if Jimmy moved or if he, I know the woman across the way died but I don't remember you know what happened to James for instance I just lost track of all of them but yeah there were the other people that lived in the village were um George and Nadine Young Dr. Vivian's son George and his wife Nadine I got to be good friends with them and um Terry um I can't remember his last name lived in the other house across and uh let's see i think at sun and give for a while there was a couple living there uh they left and then dave ennis lived at sun and give because he worked for new jersey conservation foundation and somehow the conservation foundation got a lease there i don't remember how that happened exactly um but the the long and short of it is that i worked for for the CESC, as we called it, the Conservation and Environmental Study Center, which had the offices and, you know, where you guys are not in the, in the general store. And um, that, that was a CETA program. So it was a specific grant funding. So when that grant funding ended, um, what happened at the time was Vivian was starting to close up shop because the funding had been drying up. And I got a job with, um, was the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions, and they had a lease at Sun and Give. Um, so there was another woman living there, Barb Fordyce, who worked for Anjek. And so I moved there and then Betty Ann um, eventually moved over with us. And she was working for, um, I think it was Ocean County Planning Board. Um, and so there were three of us that lived in Sun and Give for quite a while. And then my boyfriend moved in. So he was there too. Um, and then again, you know, we just 
just tons and tons of parties. Like, I can't tell you like the Halloween parties we had. <laughs> Dinner parties and blueberry parties. My friends would come down and we would ride our bikes from Whitesbog down to LBI um, and back. And then we would um, make blueberry pies and, you know, go swimming in the bogs. And you know, just, it, it was magic. Yeah, so one of my good friends got, got engaged at Sun and Give. And I'm really good friends with them now. Both their sons are grown and have kids of their own. And you know, it's just like a, a whole lifetime happened there. Yeah. Do you remember any types of wildlife that might have been out here? I don't know if you were like very into um, specific oh, yeah. wildlife, um, whether it was turtles or fish or birds, owls. Well, yeah, I mean, at night, you always heard um, whippoorwills really, really loud, constantly, whippoorwills, Bob White's during the day. And when friends would come to visit me in the summer, the carpenter frogs were so loud, they would say, is there a train nearby? I keep hearing a train going over the train tracks. You know, it was like, that's how it was really super loud. And in the winter, the tundra swans uh, were always really loud and the ice would be cracking. So you, in, in the winter, you'd hear these big cracks at night in the ice and, and um, you know, the areas that weren't icy, the tundra swans would be hooting and, you know, whistling and everything. Um, I mean, I was always out bird watching. That's, you know, we did that every every day. We were out. Look, I learned a lot of New Jersey birds at White's Bog because that's what we did. Um, snakes, there's tons of snakes. There's lots of, lots of hognose snakes, lots of pine snakes. Um, some corn snakes. That, I didn't really see any rattlesnakes at White's Bog. I'm trying to think what else. I don't, you know, never any really anything to with coyotes or foxes. I don't remember seeing many predators. Um, they seem to have increased over the years, but I don't remember seeing that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it's like it was like heaven living there back then. I know mean, it still is, you know, it still is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of good memories. So one of one of my friends who was a board member of the Conservation Foundation at the time, his name was Donald Jones. He had um, so, sort of single handedly preserved the Prosville Mills up on the Delaware River um, by buying it. It was going to be a strip mall, and he bought the whole complex of historic buildings, including the mill, and he held it until the state um, was it, wanted to finally agree to buy it and turn it make it part of the DNR Canal State Park. And in the process, he formed the, the uh, Delaware River Mill Society um, that was formed to lease and take care of those buildings within the state park. So he gave me their lease that they had put together um, for the Delaware River Mill Society, nonprofit organization running and managing a set of historic buildings owned by the state. So we use that lease um, and then we formed uh, the 501c3, the White's Bog Preservation Trust. Um, and you know, we pushed really hard to get a lease with the state. And this village wouldn't be there today without, probably without Donald Jones and Helen Fenske. <laughs> that we're all like helping along the way to make sure that it, it, it got a, a secure structure. We did the first Cranberry Festival. And then I guess we decided we needed a Blueberry Festival too. So we were doing two. And um, yeah, the Blueberry Festival was good. I mean, I, one of the things that I, cause I was a runner and I would run a White's Bog every day, almost every day. Um, and so were some of my friends. That's why we wanted to have the festival started off each time with the race, which, you know, was good and bad because you had to be up at like dawn to make sure that the race course was still um, up and no one had pulled all the arrows out the night before because um, it took a long time to mark that course so people wouldn't get lost. Um, so it was a lot of work just to do the, cr the cranberry and blueberry uh, 10k. Well, I guess we had blueberry was a 10k and the cranberry was a 5k. So we had to get shirts done up for both of them, get sponsorships and everything. <laughs> 